Welcome to the second episode of the Holistic Matters podcast series, Building a Healthy Lifestyle. I'm Megan Hamrock, and today we're talking about holistic health. That's holistic with a W. Last week, we talked about what being healthy actually means and how to make sustainable lifestyle changes. So if you missed the first episode, definitely take the time to check that out later. But today, I'm really excited about our new topic and new guest. We'll be talking about holistic health, exactly what it is and why it matters. So today we're joined by nutrition scientist Weston Bussler. He has a PhD in nutrition science from North Carolina State University, emphasizing food and agriculture. Welcome. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited. Just a quick reminder for our listeners, there are two more episodes in this season that we will release in the next two weeks on Wednesdays. All of this season's episodes will be available on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts, as well as all of the episodes from season one, Be the You Nature Intended. For additional resources and references, go online to holisticmatters.com. So as part of the Holistic Matters podcast, what exactly comes to mind when we say holistic with a W? I think the biggest thing that'll come to mind anytime you're talking about holistic is just this approach to the whole. Like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So you have everything that goes along with your holistic health. So all sorts of different ways that you can look at supporting your body and your health. Uh, You have all of these different lifestyle interventions that people can make where you're able to make all your food choices you want as well, um, all of the activities that you're doing, exercising, sleeping everything goes into this now it also translates when you start moving into your body and how all of the different systems within your body have this synergistic relationship where one is affecting the other at all times i see that interconnectedness almost throughout all of those systems as you're referring and i think that it's truly just the way that we're approaching that whole health spectrum so definitely Definitely agree with you on that. So let's just start with one of the components then of holistic health, and that's diet, right? Diet's one of the easiest tools that we can talk about that will address that whole body. And today we are living in a country where the standard American diet is pretty much the baseline diet. Um, What we found with NHANES data and what we eat in America data, by default of all of the categories that the standard American diet does include, we are more than subpar in more than one nutrient category. We're typically under consuming vegetables, whole grains, fruit and dairy consumption serving sizes, and then over consuming in the added sugar, saturated fats, and sodium categories. It's by no surprise, of course, because the SAD diet does include foods that are typically highly processed and packaged. We live in a society now where convenience is key. And I think that a lot of times we're looking for these shelf-stable options in the grocery stores. And by demand, we keep purchasing these things as consumers and they keep getting restocked and reshelved. And unfortunately, we're kind of going towards more of a comfort and entertainment quality, not necessarily nutrient density. So a lot of times we're just emphasizing the amount of calories that might be present in a lot of foods. And it's just the way that our culture has been created around this standard American diet. And we keep supporting the contents that it includes. Weston, do you have any thoughts on how the standard American diet has really come to be what it is today? Well, definitely this standard American diet, I wouldn't necessarily say it was something that we aimed to achieve. It's something that just seemed to develop out of a number of different factors. We moved away from an agrarian society where people were consuming foods that they grew themselves. And previous to that, people were foraging, looking for anything that they could wind up finding around them. So that progressed into that agrarian society where they're breeding plants for calories, trying to trying to incorporate as much of that into the diet as possible to ensure survival and carrying on to the next generation. So we continue that into this modern age where now we're efficiently able to grow food and process that food because a processed food from something can last for up to years and years. And it's so important to remember for manufacturers achieving a long shelf life, that's a very 
that shelf life is very important to ensure that that food can be have the most opportunity to be purchased. So that's why it's been so important to try to push for this higher preserved foods that are processed that people can consume. It It's valuable. And it just so happens that those foods can also be very, very delicious. We're really good at making that uh, in a way that people are going to really prefer. Problems are you're just loading them with sugars, uh, using fats when needed, adding all kinds of stabilizers to these foods, just stuff that is taking away from that whole food that it once was, that we know so many of these foods are missing in the SAD diet. They're missing what's called a nutrient density. Nutrient density then is when you have foods for every calorie that is part of that food. It's also bringing with it higher amounts of vitamins and minerals that are essential for your body's survival. So what other components, aside from the essentials that you've mentioned, are missing from the standard American diet? Well, a couple of components really that are also excluded. One can be these beneficial live microorganisms. The microorganisms that are found on all of these things that we eat, when we would get them from the wild without doing any kind of processing, you're constantly ingesting all of these different microbes. And they have so much ability to interact with your immune system as well as the food that you've consumed to produce different metabolites that can influence your health. As well, you have what are called phytonutrients in the plant. And these phytonutrients are the non-essential components that plants produce themselves that are able to influence health overall. So there are all sorts of different compounds. One of the most common groups is called the flavonoids. Flavonoids are found throughout many different plants and are often associated with health benefits as well as things like the colors of the plant. Now, one of the really interesting things that you start looking at with these phytonutrients in the plants is how they're tied together by a few different characteristics in people. One of them, other than health benefits, would be the fact that many of them are perceived as bitter flavors and off notes. And these bitter flavors and off notes, before we really understood the healthy backbone of these plants being the, the non-essentials, because they, they have all kinds of different properties, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antimicrobial, many, many different things. So without knowing that it was going to have a detrimental effect, it was a goal for agriculture to breed a lot of these things out in order to create a better tasting overall product that would be more desirable. So it doesn't sound like with the standard American diet what exactly it is. It's more of a combination of what it's missing. It sounds like we're often lacking all of these components that you're mentioning, being that found in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and kind of that the bigger piece of the puzzle. So we're talking a lot about balance, and we're balancing out those macronutrients, the micronutrients, and the phytonutrients. So lots of nutrient action, and I know we will dive deeper into this in the future episode, but it's also something to consider when we're looking for resources and where do you find that kind of information. And I know Holistic Matters does have a lot of great references that we can go ahead and share with you all. Yeah, so definitely it's that it's that right balance between, I mean, you need enough calories to uh, work on your daily life, grow, thrive, but carrying everything along with it. And, as, and this all comes from food choices. So the different types of food choices you're making uh, are going to be really, really important. Absolutely, absolutely. And and oftentimes what we're seeing is when those food choices perhaps aren't of the best selection, we're seeing a lot of links to, you know, overweight, obesity, metabolic syndrome, things that we see really prevalently in the United States of America, for example. And this is precisely where making those lifestyle healthy changes over time can really play a role for those. Yes. Yeah, the uh, like one great example tying in with that is just this overconsumption of omega-6 versus omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, you, these are the essential fatty acids that your body is unable to make, and they have to be obtained throughout the diet. Now, as we've been really good at taking 
taking a small little vegetable or grain and squeezing it for the oil, isolating it, we've gotten to the point now where we're overproducing and overgiving these omega sixes, which are the one component of your bo- of the essential fats that your body can't make that are tied towards the pro-inflammatory response, while missing a lot of the omega threes that are often derived from things such as fatty fish that are tied to the anti-inflammatory actions of these fatty acids. And these are all components that definitely need to be considered when we're thinking of what do we need to be adding into our everyday consumption. So I think this is just kind of the whole attribution of what that standard American lifestyle is. It's not just going to be about what we are consuming, but it's also going to have to be that combination of what else we're doing with our time, right? We're going to be eating however many meals a day, but what we're doing with those other hours of the day and maybe how stressed we're being or how much we are exercising or how much we're sleeping, how much screen time we have and sedentary behavior, all of these things are going to have this interconnectedness, that holistic health that we keep mentioning and bringing up. And I think that's just something that we've accepted as a day-to-day routine that we may have, but it is something that the standard American diet or lifestyle has really kind of put on us as a way of that routine. So what are we going to do to change it? What are, what are our best approaches for this? I really like that term, standard American lifestyle. That's really a good way of encompassing the the holistic aspect of this discussion and how all of these things work together for it. Absolutely. So as we see, the standard American diet definitely has much room for improvement. And when we're thinking about diet, typically we're talking about things that we would consume. And that's oftentimes a really comfortable place to start for most people who are looking to kind of take the standard American diet and revamp it or renovate it. And society has done a really great job up to this point, putting a few obstacles in place in order for us to achieve an optimal diet and lifestyle. Um, But it all definitely can be managed through actionable goals. And I know we did talk a lot about that in episode one, meaning what is it to be healthy and how can we go ahead and incorporate some of this into what we're calling that standard American lifestyle and overcoming such boundaries. But Weston, I'd love to pick your brain and talk about what are some of those challenges or obstacles that might be in the way of achieving such. Yeah, absolutely. I think the number one thing is convenience for individuals. So it's so easy when you're purchasing vegetables and fruits to just let them sit in the refrigerator until they go bad. So uh, that I see as one of the major issues because those things that consist of the standard American diet, so often they're hyper convenient. It's something that you pick up while you're out on the road. You don't have to make yourself that company wound up having that shipped to them ready to be made very quickly so it had to be made in a way that that's possible then on top of that these things that we've talked about how long they can last that is a very very tough thing to overcome for individuals with these foods that would be higher nutrient density however possibly less convenient depending on the format as well than just overall trying to move away from certain processing techniques that favor a lot of these more more negative components of the standard American diet, looking for new ways that we can ensure stability for things uh, that, that we eat and how we consume them. Another challenge is overcoming a lot of the, the soil nutrient density degradation that's occurred over time. And this has really, really been um, a negative aspect that's occurred from modern agricultural practices that if you look back at the nutrient content of foods that were produced uh, many years ago, they're actually delivering higher amounts of various vitamins and minerals. Much of this has been attributed to that soil loss of nutrients, which has occurred over time. So companies, producers, farmers, they can assure that they're, or they can work towards assuring a higher nutrient density soil with various practices. So looking for areas that are doing those is very important. And then another one would be dealing with the seasonality of foods. Food seasonality uh, is something that's 
very very exciting so you're able to get foods certain times of the year it's oh it's apple season it's strawberry season late october you're looking at pumpkins uh, squash all these things that are fantastic and they're produced able to be produced locally selecting for those seasonalities can be really helpful knowing things haven't been bred to travel across very long distances and still taste the same and look the same once they get to you there could be a lot of unnecessary nutrient degradation that occurred from them then on top of that the a last point i would say is just as a consumer making it a demand that your food is very nutritious uh, so one of the challenges here would be it's a it's expensive to produce highly nutritious food for, for groups. It doesn't always mean they're going to be getting the most bang for their buck from a yield standpoint. They're not going to be able to, um, it's, it's not the smallest amount of input possible, but if it's a real big emphasis on the community to push for these foods that are highly nutritious, then all of a sudden you're going to see attitudes start to change at the production level. I love that, creating that demand. We have to be the advocates for our own health and kind of what we are actually wanting to see to make that that healthy change. And as overwhelming as it sounds, it's something that, again, when you break it down and to the different phases of creating such a lifestyle change, it's something that is quite manageable. So I'm excited to see some of the, the changes occurring to this standard American diet um, over time with kind of all the key points that you've mentioned. And when we're talking about all of these challenges, it is really important to pay attention to the fact that you do need all of these amazing nutrients and phytonutrients in your diet. And a lot of times it is hard to do. And there are, the good news about all of that is the fact that there are companies out there who have taken this as a prime objective of theirs to be able to incorporate it into a consumable that is beneficial for your health all around. So do know that there is a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel, if you would, when it comes to proper nutrient choices, and we encourage you to, to seek those out. So overall, the standard American diet does have too much processed foods and too little of the micro and phytonutrients that we keep bringing home to the point here that we do need into our diet. But definitely it can be overcome with nutrition and whole food nutrient solutions. So there are options and we hope that you'll use Holistic Matters as a really great resource and tool to be able to make such changes that you do have in your diet. So we hope that you'll stay tuned for the next two episodes of season two of the Holistic Matters podcast series, Building a Healthy Lifestyle, to be released once a week on Wednesdays. We'll be talking about the Whole Food Advantage. You can subscribe to the Holistic Matters podcast series on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also go online to holisticmatters.com. For more from the Holistic Matters podcast series in the meantime, be sure to check out season one, Be the You, Nature Intended. We'll see you next week. The music featured on today's episode is from the artist Lee Rusevere, licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License.